is the news and talk of Texas. Now, it's the Rick Roberts Show on 820 AM, 99.5 FM, HD2, News Talk 820, WBAP. Well, I know there's got to be a few hundred million more like me just trying to keep it free. Yeah. Rick Roberts starts. Rick Roberts starts right, right now. now. And 2.04 the time. Welcome to Court of Public Opinion Monday edition. Hope you had a good, a great weekend. Man, we got a ton of stuff to get to. We're going to be talking with somebody that uh, has been involved with these investigations, these bombings and so forth a little bit later in light of what's uh, occurred in Austin. Uh, Also, if you live in Fort Worth and you smoke... (laughs) Probably shouldn't. I'll tell you about that in just a little bit. Something, uh, well, something starts today that may put a uh, a crimp in your style. If you like to have a sparkling beverage and a uh, and a cool at the same time in Fort Worth. Uh, But first, I'm very very pleased to have with me uh, David Prince, owner of Eagle Gun Range, both in Farmers Branch and Louisville. As uh, you may recall, we were. uh, Talking with David for, gosh, the last couple of weeks about the fallen Richardson police officer. And um, David stepped up to do a raffle, and it kind of grew organically. I think David initially wanted to raise about $10,000 for the widow and uh, the two uh, two daughters. And uh, with your help, um, far exceeded that. With me is uh, David Prince. David, you had a raffle today, right? Yes, sir. We had the drawing at 10 o'clock when we first opened. Our first customer came in, and we asked him to draw seven tickets, and we were able to call everybody, and we've been uh, excited to uh, have raised $41,461 for wow. Nicole, Emily, and Grace. That's uh, that's amazing. That's I mean, that really is amazing. It's heart heartwarming to know that there's that many people that love the our thin blue line and love this family and, and want to, to- show their support. Well, I've had people emailing me all day. Do you know who won this? Do you know who won that? Uh, so I'm going to let you tell them. How's that? Uh, we, we've uh, reached out to several of them. We're still working on some of this, but uh, there's Anna from Denton and Mike uh, is from uh, the Denton area as well. Uh, Richard is an 85 year old gentleman. He's won. We're, they're still trying to pick out what they uh, they want. So we haven't had a chance to get all that tied down. Uh, one of them's going to win that FN scar, and the other one's going to win the HK 40 cal pistol and a Circle J fire pit. So they were all have uh, we're still trying to reach everybody and make sure everybody's picked up things they wanted. The star tickets have all been awarded. Uh, there was uh, Julie and uh, James and Norm. Oh, that's so great. We've, in fact, one of your listeners. Um, I think it was the 85, 85-year-old gentleman from uh, uh, Denton, Richard, I think, has uh, picked out the, uh, the fire pit. And then one of your listeners, uh, James, uh, won two of them. He won the uh, <laughs> uh, star tickets and then won the uh, fitness. Uh, somebody called in after the show Friday and wanted us to award uh, a free membership to their gym. Oh wow! Oh so wow! Your your listeners have stepped up in a massive way, as as, as you have, Rick. I mean, it's we 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 were expecting ten thousand, and like I said, you you get embracing this and and, and giving us the time. Uh, I mean, that's just short of a miracle that we've raised forty one thousand four hundred and sixty one dollars for this precious family. Oh, that's uh, you know what it, it's. Uh, the audience never ceases. I've been doing this a long time. I've been on television, uh, talk radio, radio, uh, talk radio for 25 years. And every time you reach out to the audience, I don't do it often, but every time they always come through. I mean, you know, we started the Warrior Foundation in uh, in San Diego out of Balboa Hospital. Um, and it all started because uh, a Navy mom and a Navy wife, uh, Sandy Limcooler, came to me and said, can I ask for donations for razors so the guys in Balboa amputees wow. can stay squared away? Well, we raised so much money, we said, what do we do with the rest of this? Well, let's start a foundation. Um, in four years, $17.5 million, uh, got a donation from uh, 
uh, Sumner Redstone um, and uh, bought an apartment complex, had it completely outfitted for amputees so the guys could go from the hospital to the apartment complex rent-free with their families to sort of ease their way back into civilian life. And it's still going today. It's called freedomstation.org. And, uh, you know, every time you reach out to the audience, they're there. I mean, all of that, that 17 million was through donations, $5, $50. Um, well, I've, I've got to think of Sumner Redstone for a half a mil, but I mean, wow. you know, we did, uh, we did all kinds of things, you know, six pack fishing tours and golf tournaments and all that kind of thing. The audience is always there. If it's a good and valid, uh, reason, they always step up, you know, I, Many of these things couldn't be done under a government program, uh, but they could be done by reaching out to your neighbors and the people you work with and and so on. So I knew when this came up, um, we had to talk about it. So 40,000, over 40,000, 41,000 to that family, that's not going to bring their father or her husband back, but at least maybe it'll make it a little easier in the next year or so. Well, we wanted the family to know. I mean, there was over 1,200 people that stepped up to do this. And uh, to Nicole, Emily, and Grace, you know, our prayers and our best wishes go out to them. But uh, something a little bit more tangible can now go with it as well. Amen to that. Thank you, thank you for uh, everything you've done, Rick. Well, uh, this kind of wraps it up, David. I got used to talking to you every week. But uh, <laughs> David Prince is owner of the Eagle Gun Range. It's in Farmers Branch and Louisville. I've been there. I've seen the facilities, state-of-the-art place. Lots and lots of inventory, and you would be hard pressed to find uh, nicer people than David and his wife. They are truly salted the earth. And David, I would just want to publicly thank you for helping out this officer's family as well. well you're welcome, and God bless you for all the help you've been to. David Prince, Eagle Gun Range, I appreciate it very, very much. 11 minutes after the hour, uh, if you're in Fort Worth and you smoke, and you like to have an adult beverage, you might get used to doing that at home. Your call straight ahead. Two fifteen, the time. I'm Rick Roberts. This is the Court of Public Opinion. Your afternoon drive for Dallas-Fort Worth, and uh, of course, if you're listening anywhere in the country, it's toll-free, 1-800-288-WBAP, 1-800-288-9227. Again, my thanks to David Prince and Eagle Gun Range uh, for really stepping up and making that thing happen. Troy in Richardson. Uh, Troy, thanks for waiting. How you doing? Yes, sir. How are you? I'm very well, thanks. I just wanted to call in and thank you and Mr. Prince. I was hoping to talk to him too for everything y'all have done for uh, Richardson, Nicole, and, and Emily and Grace. Um, I'm a police officer in Richardson and worked with Dave for years. Um, just I just can't tell you how much we appreciate all the support from the community that we've received and just wanted to say thank you and express my gratitude to him also. Well, David, uh, if you don't know David, it'd be worth, uh, you know, when you got some time, um, maybe on a shift change or something, stopping by and just saying, uh, hello, you won't meet a nicer guy. I was very surprised. I just met the man probably, uh, six months ago, maybe not that long. Um, and I have family in law enforcement. I, I've seen my son-in-law, you know, get ready for work and kiss the babies goodbye, pat the dog on the head, go get his dog out of the kennel and, uh, you know, all he wants to do is his job and come home at the end of the day and be with my daughter and the kids. And, and uh, you know, I, I wish more people could see that side of law enforcement because it's a very important side. Well, just on a side note, I've got my dog with me right now. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, has yours already destroyed the interior? I, I, I think my son-in-law is on his second interior so far. No, mine's very good at that. Uh, man, I, I've, I've seen some stuff, uh, but, uh, you know, of course, you know, in canine, you get a take home car, but, um, that dog just absolutely destroyed the interior of that, uh, that SUV twice. And maybe they got him calmed down now. I don't know. They use the Belgians now. They don't use the, the shepherds so much, but, um, thank you for what you do. Um, I think, uh, 
as indicated by, you know, how much was raised in a very short period of time. The community cares about what you guys do. They support you. And we just, you know, I could thank you all day long, but that wouldn't be enough. So thank you, sir. All right. Well, thank you. All right. Um, yeah, that, uh, you know, it's important. It's important to let law enforcement know how you feel uh, because they get it. They get a steady diet, a steady diet of, you know, cops are bad, cops do this, cops do that. And, you know, maybe they had a bad encounter at one point. Who knows? Uh, but at, at the end of the day, they're just like you. They want to go to work. They want to do a decent job. Um, you know, they need to make a, a fair wage so they can support their family and go home at the end of the shift. You know, that's that's the main thing. So, yeah, you can, uh, you know, pull out personal anecdotes here and there. Um, but this would not be a place you'd want to live, um, without some type of law enforcement, just, just that simple. Um, all right, let me ask you this. Do you live in Fort Worth? Do you go to Fort Worth? Now I, I can't tell you personally about bingo halls. I don't, I don't know that I've ever been to a bingo hall. Uh, I used to play tournament poker a lot in casinos. But I'm, I would imagine it's pretty much the same thing as far as everybody huffing and puffing and smoking cigarettes. Um, starting today, Fort Worth's ordinance banning smoking in bars and bingo parlors. I guess they have a ton of those. I don't know. Uh, it goes into effect, and uh, the city parks and sidewalks might not be far behind. Now, I've been through this before in Southern California. I mean, there are some places in Southern California where you can't smoke outside on your own front porch. Now, I'm not going to be a hypocrite. I was a smoker for eons. Um, and, you know, every every year I had my physical and had my lungs checked. No, you're fine. You're fine. Um, you know, you're, my lungs today are as clear as they ever could be. But they don't tell you, or if they did, I wasn't paying attention, Um what kind of damage you can do to your heart by smoking doesn't have to end up in your lungs. Uh, so long story short, uh, I, you know, after a couple stints and all of that, you know, what do you want to do? You want to smoke or you want to stick around for a while? Well, I chose the latter. So when it comes to smoking, I would never advocate smoking. Um, I would say if you smoke, stop sooner the better. If you don't smoke, don't start. But I'm not one of those former smokers that can see through my binoculars somebody a half a mile away puffing on a cigarette, and then, don't you love this, they start going, uh, 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 uh. you know, the fact that they see somebody smoking makes them start coughing. Um, I'm not one of those guys, uh, all right? If, I mean, you're, you're a big person. You do what you want to do. It's bad for you. It'll kill you, um, most probably. And uh, secondhand smoke is tough too. Um, and that's, you know, the whole reason for these ordinances. Um, you know, in Southern California, uh, when they stopped smoking in the bars, everybody said, Oh no, oh, we're going to go bankrupt. We're going to go. And it didn't work that way at all. All people did was say, you know, I'll be right back. Walked outside, puffed a little bit and, uh, you know, came back and finished your drink or kept drinking or whatever they were doing. Um, so I don't see it as, as, you know, detrimental overall to the business. Um, but what I hear a lot are smokers' rights. Sm- I have rights as a smoker. What? You do? It's a chosen behavior. You can choose to smoke or not smoke if you don't want to. And a private business... Um, you know, it has to look at this uh, city ordinance, and I've been through all the arguments in Southern California and seen, oh, woe is me, I'm a private business, I can do this and I can do that. Well, you know, banning smoking in a park, in an open area, or on a city sidewalk, to me, is ridiculous. It's a good idea, probably uh, gone too far. doesn't make any sense. Um, the city council updated the city's smoking ordinance to include bars and bingo parlors. Um, and, uh, you know, the new law goes into effect right now. Organizations pushing for a smoke-free city, they pursued the change. And I guess, you know, you got a right to do that. Saying the city has not kept pace with public sentiment and data shows the ill effects of secondhand smoke. 
Well, you can't say secondhand smoke is harmless. It's not. Uh, it's been scientifically proved, you know, over a period of time that, you know, it's bad for you. Um, despite voting against the updates to the ordinance, uh, what was it, District 4 in, in Fort Worth, I think, Councilman Kerry Moon asked that the ordinance include parks and public sidewalks. Well, okay, now see, that just, that doesn't make any sense. That's stupid. You're in an open-air park, unless I'm right up on you, one of those close talkers. Hey, what are you doing? Oh, I got, you got smoke in my face. Well, you're on a 10-acre park. You know, walk 20 feet someplace else if you want to. That doesn't make any sense. Um, sidewalks. Somebody smoking a cigarette as they walk by you. Oh, <laughs> call the police. <laughs> I think that's stupid too. But when it comes to bars and places like that where people have to work that may not smoke, it's a different situation. Marshall in Bedford. Marshall, how you doing? I'm doing fine today, sir. Good. What I want to say is this. I quit voluntarily smoking four packs a day in 1993. And let me ask you a question. Do you remember Muse Air that operated out of Texas? It was a non-smoking airline. No, I, I don't recall that. Uh, in the late 70s, uh, when Braniff was falling, Lamar Muse was part of Braniff's board. He started a non-smoking airline. lasted about two years because nobody flew the thing or else it would still be going. Most bars, bowling alleys, and things like that, bingo halls, most people smoke. Why doesn't somebody open up a non-smoking bar, bowling alley, and bar, and let's see how fast those go out of business. Smokers, as much as I hate smoking, they do have their rights. Well, not really. They don't. It's a chosen behavior, and it's already been proven uh, legislatively and legally. Uh, you can ban certain behavior in your business. You know, I'm not saying I disagree with you. Um, I, I'm just saying, uh, as far as an airline goes, smoking on an airplane, uh, we were, must have been out of our minds. You know, you're at uh, you know, 30,000 feet in an aluminum cigar, uh, cigar tube, uh, and whatever anybody has is being recycled through their filters, and you're breathing it. Um, you know, that, that, of course you shouldn't smoke in that situation. Here, let me put you in an airtight room pump in oxygen, and cigarette smoke at the same time for a couple hours, all right? I mean, that's just insane. You know, if I venture to say if you had a smoking airline, uh, that would go out of business now. 225, I appreciate the call, Marshall. Thank, I'm glad you quit. Four packs a day. That's almost 100 cigarettes a day. Well, I'm not judging, man. Uh, two, I did it myself. 225 the time, your call. Straight ahead on News Talk, 820 WBAP. All right, at two thirty three, the time. If uh, if you want to drink. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm no stranger to adult beverage, that's for sure. But uh, a lot of people, you know, they, uh, well, it's just like in the morning. I remember when I used to smoke, um, you know, the first thing I did in the morning, it, it was weird. The first thing I would do in the morning is, you know, get up, trick over the dog, hit the coffee machine, get on the treadmill, then have a cigarette. Yeah, I know, it's stupid. Um, but just like uh, smoking with your coffee, and if you've recently quit, just me saying that already is getting you to drool like Pavlov's dog. Uh, but a lot of people, you know, they they smoke and drink at the same time. Well, you're not going to do that in Fort Worth anymore. Um, you know, extending it to parks, uh, open air spaces, and sidewalks, I think is a little silly. I, silly. I've seen people that uh, either didn't smoke or reformed smokers. Some reformed smokers are the worst. You know, you're walking down a sidewalk and you see somebody with a cigarette in their hand. Oh my gosh, I got to cross over the street. Why? You know, depending on the wind, you're probably not even going to smell it. That That's going too far. Uh, but uh, as far as bars and bingo halls, which I guess are a big deal, and, and I've never been to a bingo hall. But, um, 
evidently it's a big deal in Fort Worth. You're laughing. What do you go to bingo halls? Is that what is, is that what the, what the smirks about? Yeah, I love playing bingo. Love it. You're kidding? No. I thought bingo. Forgive me. I don't, okay. I don't mean to be an idiot here, but I don't know anything about. It. I thought bingo was for retired women. Mostly, yes. Okay, well, see. I'm... I, I mean, I'm like the young pup in there. He's retired from the Navy. Well, okay. Okay, right. so, so you, okay, no, I got one. Yeah, I got there one. There you go. All right. Um, I win every once in a while. Uh, you don't smoke, do you? No, but it's full of smoke, but well, I know what I'm going into. Well, exactly. exactly. And I don't but, complain about it. But what about the people that work there? They don't have a choice. They That's their job, and... It's full of smoke. I mean, that, that is that not fair? I mean, if there's a health issue, it's going to come back on the employer anyway. Well, the one I go to, the people that are passing out the cars you buy from and stuff like that, no. they are they have a cigarette in their hand while they're doing it. Sometimes I have ash on the stuff that they hand to me, so it's a, I'm, I just laugh at it. Okay. Roy and Granberry. Roy, thanks for waiting. How you doing? Oh, I'm doing fine. It's such an honor to talk to you, sir, and I uh, really appreciate your show and your and you take my call. Thank you, sir. Uh, I appreciate that. No, it's, it's fun listening to you. Anyway, um, I, was, I was, like I was telling you, a screener, I'm a musician, been a musician all my life. So I played in a lot of smoky bars. And uh, about the middle 2000s, um, and I, I was an ex-smoker myself. I quit in my mid-20s. Um, like I was telling your screener, um, I was having some problems singing. My throat was drying out. So my girlfriend finally made me go to an ENT, and he's, does that little scope down your nose and just right. looked at my vocal cords, pulled it back out and said, uh, do you smoke? And I said, no. He asked me what I did for a living. And I told him and he said, uh, he said, well, it looks like you smoke about a pack a day just from secondhand smoke. Yeah. Yeah. And it, uh, but you know, uh, he gave me some medicine and shortly after that, uh, a lot of the bars in Fort Worth, especially started making people go outside to smoke. So, and then well, they're going to have to starting today. Oh, yes, yes. I, I, I'm all for that. You know, I'm an ex-smoker, but I'm not that guy that runs across the street whenever I see somebody coming toward me. <laughs> you know, I, I got to tell you, I, I, w- I wasn't raised by uh, my biological mother and father. I was raised by my grandparents. But, you know, through the course of my childhood, uh, my mom would, you know, delve into, okay, let me see if I can pull off this parenting thing. And it would be short-lived, but I appreciate the all effort. Right. She was a professional musician. She played uh, oh, okay. uh, She was played piano and did backup vocals for Dean Martin in Vegas for like 20 years. Oh, wow. And, and then she had her own band, and they toured Europe. She went and she smoked and drank. Yeah. Um, and she couldn't sing without it. And I, I remember the story. Um, you know, she went to the doctor and she said, I'm losing my voice. And he said, well, you're smoking too much. But when she would quit smoking, she'd lose her voice entirely. So, you know, I try to tell people if you haven't started smoking, man, don't do it. I mean, there are so many different things that can go wrong, not just with your lungs. You know, people think of lung cancer, um, and, but your heart and everything else, it's just not worth it. Yes, that's true. And, uh, you know, uh, my mom was a piano player also. And that's why, you know, I started taking lessons when I was nine years old. And I'm 66 now, so been doing it for a while. But I, I took this uh, gig. Uh, I'm, in, I'm retired now, so I'm s- still playing music. But I took this gig down in Granbury, and we play in Granbury a lot. They allow smoking in Granbury. And I can almost feel that raspiness in my voice coming back, you know. So yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's kind of full circle, you know. <laughs> So well, anyway. I, you know, I, as a talk, talk show host, both on radio and television, I, for a long time, I smoked. Well, when I started in talk radio, you could, you could smoke sitting here behind the microphone and I don't know how much you actually smoke. You lit it, you know, took a couple of drags and it probably burned itself out in the ashtray, but you know, that was pretty quick to change. And, um, you know, after that, uh, if I would quit smoking, I would totally lose my voice, just totally lose it. Um, but I mean, when it comes to staying alive or smoking, can't <laughs> take about a nanosecond to figure out. So, you know, I just don't do it. And as far as Fort Worth goes, I mean, they're just falling in line with every other city. I mean, it's, it's, I, I heard people, you know, just railing it. I have rights as smoker. No, you don't. Not really. In your own space, in your own home. Yeah, you probably do. You can do what you want long as it's legal uh, i just see the hypocrisy with cigarettes that's all you know they're bad for you i mean how many uh, anti-cigarette uh, or anti-smoking commercials do you see on television 
just day in and day out, right? But they're for sale, you know, because everybody's getting their cut of the tax. So, you know, if you don't want people smoking, just get rid of them, I guess. You know, you know, if you're a smoker, um, I'm sorry, your day isn't complete without a carton of cools and a case of Schlitz, then, you know, you got a right to do that, but not in a public place where other people are affected. Um, all right. Uh, let's go to, uh, thank you for the call, Roy. I appreciate it very much. Marty in Spokane, Washington. Marty, how you doing? Well, I'm above ground and vertical, so I'm doing good. Hey, you're ahead of the game. <laughs> Well, we started that thing back in uh, Spokane County here a few years ago. I think it's been about four or five years ago where there was a smoking ban on uh, taverns and other places where you could go in and like maybe a smoking section in a restaurant. You, right. you really can't find a place anymore now in Spokane County that will allow you to smoke unless you go to uh, one of the Native American casinos. And, of course, there are uh, exempt from any uh, state or federal laws as far as that goes. But there was a large talk about how it was going to be detrimental to the establishments that we're not going to be able to cater anymore to smokers. And after probably a couple months went by, it really the, nobody saw a really huge difference in the amount of patrons they were getting. Um the only restriction now in in the uh, state of Washington is you can't smoke within 25 feet of a building entrance. Right, right. But, I, I uh, think other than that, I think we got you know the same thing happened in Southern California. There was this outcry, uh, primarily from smokers, and I understood it because I used to smoke. You know, uh, uh, the bars are going to close down. Nobody's going to do well. Wait a minute. <laughs> Hold on a second. Uh, you go to a bar to what? Smoke? No, to have a adult beverage. Uh, if you smoke and you could do both at the same time, I guess that's okay. All they found was is that people uh, started using the outside patios um, more often, and so they, you know, they put up those uh, those gas heaters you see and all that. Didn't change anything. Yeah, that's kind of what uh, what happened here. You know, in the winter time up here, um, you know, it can get below zero, uh, and you know, it's maybe not the most comfortable thing to go outside and have a cigarette. But, um, you know, people adapted, and, and I always found it more pleasurable to go into a restaurant. Even though I was a smoker at the time, I would go into a restaurant, and I'd sit in the no-smoking section just because right. I didn't want to be, you know, smelling it. And, and, what, uh, and what, you about, know, what about you? When we come back, I'm going to – I've got to step aside, Marty. But when we come back, you know what got my attention? The study that they did. Are you a smoker at home? I mean, are you just – you know, just puffing and blowing and going all day long at home. Do you have a pet? I'll tell you about that next. It was amazing. And it's funny what catches your attention, right? All right. Tell you about that in just a second. 242 the time. I'm Rick Roberts. News Talk 820 WBAP. All right, 2.47 the time. I'll tell you what got my, uh, I know people are upset, they're angry. It's my right to smoke in the bar. I can do it if I, well, no, it's not really a right. You know, what's the old saying? Uh, there are no rights without responsibilities. And, you know, if, if you don't have a right to do it. Well, it's a private business. No, that doesn't work either. Uh, I'll tell you what got my attention. Um, I'm a big dog person. Ranger was my Shiloh Shepherd uh, for about, gosh, I had Ranger for 13 and a half years, I guess. Stopped a carjacking, um, stopped another attack out of a convenience store. Uh, he was uh, Schutzen Level 2 trained. He was obedience trained. Uh, he had all his certifications so he could ride with me in the plane instead of in the baggage compartment. Um, anyway, he was with me. Con he was at work with me. He was under the console. I did the show in my car all the time. Anyway, I read this study uh, that shows animals in a house where there's a smoker uh, face all kinds of health risks when they're exposed to some of the toxins in secondhand smoke, um, allergies and, you know, respiratory problems and things like that. For dogs, nasal and lung cancer in dogs, and I had no idea, and lymphoma in cats, and it's really bad in cats because of their grooming habits. They're always licking themselves. And nicotine, as you see on your windows, is on your cat. Um, 
secondhand smoke has been associated with oral cancer, lymphoma in cats, lung and nasal cancer in dogs, as well as lung cancer in birds. You know, like I said, one reason cats are susceptible, I'm not, I'm not a cat person, but I don't want to see them die, uh, is because they're grooming hab- habits, and dogs are usually, you know, pretty close to the owners. The owners are smoking. So, you know, like it's a, it's a bad deal. Everybody knows it's a bad deal. But I'm not going to tell you don't smoke. Just, you know, I wouldn't want to sit and do the show with a co-host that was puffing away because I've already gone through that. I know what uh, is at risk, and I don't want to do it. Uh, let's go to uh, Mitch in Dallas. Mitch, thanks for waiting. How you doing, Mitch? Good. How are you doing? I'm good. Hey, it's been a while since I talked to you. But anyway, I'll try to get to my point. Okay. Um, and... Let me start out by saying I understand that obviously there were more non-smokers voted than smokers. Okay, say or that again. More, more non-smokers were worried about this than the smokers, or else they wouldn't have voted this to be a law. So I am a smoker, and I do smoke at my house, but I smoke outside the house. Right. But my thing is, my argument, I guess, with you is that although smoking is a... a decision that you make so is where you work this is a right to work state so if you know that you're going to be working at a bar you know everybody that there's going to be smoking there or at least up until today so i don't see where that's an argument as far as well actually it's not so in a bar it's not so much the employees but employers uh, we're getting stuck with uh, health cost bills from employees that were having detrimental uh, you know whether they had bronchitis or whether, you know, one thing after another. But, I mean, if I go into, a, or used to, if I would go into a bar and it was like you could see the smoke hanging in the air, I'd, you know, I'd get as far away from it as I could or I'd go to a different bar. Um, you know, when you talk about employment, uh, you know, there's a legal argument for a safe uh, and healthy work environment. You know, I'm sure some people have tried to explore that. I think a lot of that stuff... Um, Common sense should take care of, but it doesn't. We're the most litigious country on planet Earth. Well, that's true, and common sense isn't so much common anymore. No, that's but, true. You know, there's a lot of hazards with my profession. I'm a mechanic, you know, but they give you training and they have you sign waivers, you know? So and, what's the analogy from being a mechanic or smoking in a bar? Well, same with the, you're talking about the employers getting sued or having financial burdens because of these getting sued. Well, if you're a mechanic, but if you're a mechanic for a shop or an independent even, or, or a chain shop, unless you're a shade tree mechanic, um, you know, you have OSHA, you have all kinds of stuff uh, that has been put in place for your protection. I mean, it's not like well, come on in, turn a wrench, you know, hopefully you'll be okay. I mean, they're, it's a little more involved than that. That's true. I guess that's a good point. The OSHA thing is a good point. Well, you know, I, I look at it like the, I, the I look at it this way. Restaurant owners OSHA. I, I look at it this way. For the same reason, you know, they started outlawing smoking in restaurants. You know, people were saying food tastes bad. All the reasons. And I don't know that it's all accurate. You know, they could be, you know, they could be, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? They could be pushing it over the top, and I'm sure they, they do sometimes. But the fact is, if it's a city ordinance, you got to obey the, the city ordinance. And, and you know, it's already been proven everywhere that it's happened. It doesn't, doesn't hurt business. Well, hopefully some of this common sense that we were talking about falls into play when they start trying to uh, keep us from eating beef or drinking a soda <laughs> don't go to new york don't go to new well i know yeah, i mean I th- just a quick story just real quick yeah i, I got about 30 seconds over, left okay i've moved out here a little over 20 years ago my sister and her husband and i were walking through the mall and i was kind of behind them and they turned around and they said hey what are you doing i said nothing i'm just looking you can't smoke in here well where i came from you could smoke in a mall but i was walking through the small mall smoking <laughs> Anyway, hey, you take care. Thanks for taking my call. All right, buddy. I appreciate it. 2.54 of the time. Well, look, um, if you smoke, uh, you know, I, I'm not sitting in judge of you. You know, I, I just don't do that. I, I smoked 
for years and years and years. And I heard all the ads and I did all the stuff, but it wasn't until I got ready to quit that I quit, you know, and for me, I'm stubborn and I'm pig headed and I don't listen to a lot of people I should be listening to. And I quit for medical reasons. Right. And quite honestly, I know this sounds stupid coming from Rick Roberts. I quit because of my dog, uh, it just, you know, he was, if I'm going to want him with me everywhere underneath my feet in the console, in the car or in the truck, in the house, the rest of it, you know, he, he didn't ask for that. You know, <laughs> I mean, I, I try to buy the right food. So why would I blow smoke in his face? That doesn't make much sense. Um, but you do what you want to do. You do what you want to do. If you're a business in Fort Worth, you're not going to lose business. It, you know, it's going to change. You're going to see different customers. Uh, people will adapt and it's, everybody's probably going to be better off for it. Two fifty-five the time. All right. Uh, I got something for you. Um, Nancy Pelosi went back to her roots with RuPaul. I'll tell you about that next. This is the news and talk of Texas. Now it's the Rick Roberts show on 820 AM, 99.5 FM, HD2, News Talk 820, WBAP. Well, I know there's got to be a few hundred million more like me just trying to keep it free. Yeah. Rick Roberts starts. Rick Roberts starts right now. All right, four minutes after the hour, 3.04 the time. Got something coming up here. Uh, you may need to start thinking about, what is it, about a year before the 2020 elections really kick into high gear? Um, I've got the top 15 Democratic presidential candidates for 2020 ranked, ranked in order of importance. The, these are the Democrats that most likely will be running against uh, Donald Trump in 2020. I've also got the top 10 Republicans that will be uh, running as well. I'll do that in just a second. But first, Nancy, I've lost what was left of my mind. Pelosi uh, has gone back to her roots of pandering to the gays. Um, she's appearing as a guest judge on a show about drag queens with RuPaul. You like the drag kings, Randy? You know what I'm talking about there? I like drag racing, but not drag queens. Okay, well, right. I don't have anything against them. I just don't have a, a cause to be Not that there's with anything them. wrong with that. No, yeah. Okay. Sir. How about you, Dave? <laughs> no, I don't have anything for the drag queen, You're drag not, lifestyle at all. Not, in, no. not into the no. drag. You know, they say. I'll play like, bingo, but not that. <laughs> they say that most drag queens are straight. I, I I find that hard to believe. I'm not believing that for one second. Yeah, well, haven't you ever heard the Monty Python song, the Lumberjack song? I do not like Monty Python. There is nothing about Monty Python I like. You know, my real father was from Sterling, Scotland. Yes, and I was around him for a little bit, and you couldn't understand anything he said because of his brogue. And then after he had a couple, a couple scotches, you really couldn't understand what he's. I don't. I think maybe in the entire time I knew him, I got three words. Uh, the rest of it, I have no idea. Same thing with Python. You know, it just... Uh, well, I, I did a year and a half in the Outback, so I kind of can pick up bits and pieces. It helps, yeah. though, if you have the, uh, uh, the subtitles in. Yeah. Well, back to drag queens. Uh, the House Majority Leader spoke with the media accusing Donald Trump of being a drag queen. No, I'm kidding. She didn't say that. Uh, she accused Trump of not having enough respect for the LGBTQ community. Um, and that he liked the drag queens on stage is lip syncing some of his policies. I don't know, Nance. It seems to me that compared to the previous eight years, we're doing okay. Um, just because Nancy says so, it's not necessarily fact. Um, born RuPaul Andre Charles. Well, that's what happened right there, his name. Uh, the gay male and drag queen is considered one of the most successful drag queens in the world, has produced 14 albums, several... I, I, RuPaul is 57, has appeared in several movies, um, I guess hangs out with Geraldo and Arsenio Hall, 
And his first note, whatever happened to Arsenio Hall? Yeah, I guess he's still around. I guess he went belly up. Uh, yeah. I guess I was hanging out with RuPaul. That's well, right. I, I thought he, him and Eddie Murphy, Eddie was a whole lot better than okay, Arsenio. Okay, careful, so. careful. I'm Rick, just saying. Right. Uh, um, in any case, Nancy Pelosi is part of RuPaul's Drag Race. Well, there you go, Randy. You said you like that. RuPaul's Drag Race. It's a long-running reality show. It's a competition. Pits a group of men against each other in order to find out which one makes the... Oh, good Lord. Uh, Different type of drag racing. Yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm sorry. The, nothing Nancy Pelosi says or does would shock or surprise me. Because I don't think she's in control of her own faculties. I, I really don't. Uh, uh, Donald Trump uh, um, is is um, like drag queens on stage. He's uh, um, um, hello. Uh, he's lip syncing his policies. Nancy Pelosi. I mean, I feel so. I don't even dislike her anymore. I just feel sorry for her. She's sort of like you know the crazy lady that lives at the end of the block you know you walk by her house and you know she comes in you want a cookie no that's we're we're good thanks Uh, she just reminds me of somebody that has been at the party too long and she needs to probably you know go back to her winery in california sit on the veranda sip wine you know i i could have been a drag queen no nancy you couldn't that's a whole different deal oh really Uh, it just she's she says the most ridiculous things against Republicans and conservatives, but you can't really even blame her for it. I mean, look at her. You know, she's trembling and, you know, looking off and trying to figure out, oh, well, uh, uh, am I talking? Yes. Uh, she, she doesn't know what she's doing. And if you were a good Democrat, you would go get her, put her in the back seat, driving Miss Nancy, and take her back to California and just say, Nancy, you did a good job, and you get to stay here. Uh, where am I? You're at your winery. Oh, okay. I, I mean, that, that's, okay. Nancy, Nancy, Nancy. Uh, she's not running for anything, is she? No, drag queen judge. She got the gig. All right. When we come back, the top 15 Democratic presidential candidates for the 2020 race, which is, uh, no, it's about what? Well, about a year away before the thing kicks off and, uh, you know, full steam. And I'll have the top 10 Republicans. We'll find out where you come down next on News Talk 820. What, Nancy? <laughs> News Talk 820 WBAP. Nancy, Nancy. All right. Glad you're along. 316 the time. Um, you might take mental notes of, uh, the names you're going to hear in just a second. We've got the top 15 democratic presidential candidates, uh, that you're going to be hearing more and more about, uh, that maybe likely will be throwing their, uh, their hat in the ring for the 2020, uh, presidential race. You know, Trump got his first big legislative accomplishment this week. He also got a slew of very bad polling data. Um, Polls from Gallup, CNN, uh, just a bunch uh, showed Trump's approval ratings uh, up and then down and then down again and then up again. You know, given all that uh, Trump has gone through fighting the Democrats, the media, and his own party, you would be hard-pressed to qualify anything that he's done as uh, as anything but a success. So, you look at this, whose stock is rising and falling um, a year out? You know, what we've got here are the top 15 possible Democratic nominees. Um, and you got to look at this and say, okay, how, how does this really make sense? As usual, they're ranked in ascending order of likelihood to win the Democratic nomination. Um, 15, if I were to tell you it was another, uh, it was another, well, I guess you could call him a movie star. He's kind of a movie star. Uh, Dwayne Johnson. I like him. Don't like his politics, but I like him. 
Yes, that Dwayne Johnson. The Rock uh, keeps saying he might actually run for president, including this week when he said he's seriously considering it. Yes, he tends to say things uh, when he's promoting a movie. And yes, I know it seems ridiculous that a former professional wrestler would be a serious candidate. And yes, we don't even know which party's nomination he would seek. But one regrettable reality of the Trump era is that we can't simply laugh off this stuff anymore. Now, Oprah, well, I'll wait, you know, until, you know, I have word from a higher calling. And I wouldn't set in judgment of that. Maybe she's, t- you know, maybe that's what she feels. Um, at the very least, Johnson is, uh, he's a really good communicator. Lots of people seem to like him quite a bit. But president, what do you think about that, David? I'm not big on having The Rock as my president. You're not? I just don't see it. You don't? Why? I, I mean, can't take aside, the whole acting and the from, whole... Aside from the fact that he may be running for the Democratic nomination, I mean... Yeah, I just don't think that a ex-professional wrestler and actor is going to take us to where we need to go. Why? What if I, a few years back, would say, you know who'd be a good president? That guy that builds casinos, golf courses... You know the guy with the funny hair, Donald Trump? The guy's Trump? a million-dollar million playboy? Yeah. What would you have said I've then? always kind of liked Donald Trump, but I'm from that area where I used to watch him on TV doing all the crazy things and talking about the USFL and stuff like that. So I kind of bought into his agenda. So I'm kind of a Trump guy. Really? Okay. You secretly, yes. Randy? I would like to hear what his uh, platform would be and for have him... You it's, know, we, it's the octagon. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it is. Well, uh, you know, Trump is not a professional politician, in my opinion, and I, I don't see anything he's done to get me upset. See, this is the way I view it. <clears throat> With the, uh, the entrance of Trump into the White House, we're either going to go one way or the other. People kept saying, I want my country back. I want my country back. That's why they installed a non-politician politician. They're either going to go, you know what, this is how we need to continue. And they'll elect another non-politician politician, or they'll go diametrically reversed to, well, I was always more comfortable with a politician that said what I wanted to hear. It's going to go one way or the other, and it's going to be overwhelming. That's my prediction. Uh, That's number 15. Number 14, Virginia Governor Terry McAuliffe. Um, He's another new entrant. The entrance on the list. He's, uh, you know, he's well regarded, uh, term limited, one term governor. Uh, he he seems to be at least somewhat intrigued about running for the office. He wants to spend his uh, time trying to win for other people. For now, he's uh, basking in a very strong 2017 election for Virginia Democrats. He says he'll aggressively try to help Democrats with governorships in 2018. They need it. I mean, Democrats lost governorships at a record number all across the country. The big knock on uh, Governor Terry McAuliffe, nobody on the list is closer to the Clintons. This guy uh, might as be, well be the stepchild of Hillary and Bill. Um, and that's not going to help, even not with Democrats. All. Not at all. So he's not really a turn-the-page kind of candidate. It's like, okay, I've uh, heard this song before, same lyrics different vocalist, all right? Uh, I I would write Terry McAuliffe off just for that because uh, you say Terry McAuliffe and all of a sudden images of Hillary and Bill come up in your head. Uh, number 13, believe it or not, and we talked about this, former Starbucks CEO Howard Schultz. Now, beyond, uh, you know, this is one of those things, I don't want it to happen, but it could happen. Um it, back in September of 17, Schultz seems to uh, been talking like a candidate while insisting he's not. Um, in politics, he says, well, I'm not going to, I can do more doing what I'm doing. You know, personally, I just want a vente latte and that's it. You know, I, I don't want your politics. Um, I don't think he's going to make it simply because of that. Uh, he said, I think the country in many ways is in need of a moral, cultural, and an economic transformation. Also, if we think about the country today, I think the country needs to become more compassionate, more empathetic. Yep, definitely not talking about politics there. 
Um, I don't think people will connect with the former Starbucks CEO. Um, number 12, the former Massachusetts governor, uh, Patrick. He generally gives very little indication that he might run, although former President Obama's team is reportedly urging him to run. And I wonder about that. He did go to Alabama to campaign for Senator-elect Doug Jones. Uh, and, you know, that's nothing to write off because he was very, very involved with that. Um, Senator Dwayne Johnson, yeah, even more gifted communicator. Um, even more people seem to like him. Uh, her, excuse me. Um, so, you know, I look at this um, – and I think to myself, so far, I don't see any of these people that could beat Trump. Do you? I just don't. All right, let me step aside very quickly. Well, let me give you one more. Number 10, New York governor, yeah, believe it or not, Andrew Cuomo. Others on the list have taken a step uh, forward during the sexual harassment debate. Uh, Cuomo has taken a step back because of allegations about a former senior aide and all that kind of stuff. Uh, Cuomo told a reporter, when you say it's state government, you do a disservice to women. So he's playing that uh, that women card. Um, with all due respect, even though you're a woman, it's not government, it's society. Okay. Um, I wouldn't in any way, shape, or form count him out as running, uh, but there's no way in the world I'd vote for him either. I mean, it's Cuomo, for crying out loud. Uh, everything that's wrong with politics is manifest in what this guy does every day. Okay, we've got uh, a few more uh, Democrats, and then I'll tell you who the Republicans are that are likely to be running against Trump. 325 The Time, I'm Rick Roberts, News Talk, 820 WBAP. All right, 332 The Time. Now, believe it or not, we're... Uh, like 12 months away from um, the 2020 campaign getting underway. And, uh, you know, we're giving you a list of who has indicated they may run. Well, I'm giving you the Democrats right now. I'll give you the Republicans in just a second. Uh, number 10 on the Democrat list was uh, New York Governor Andrew Cuomo, Cuomo and uh, Fred in Bridgeport thinks I might be selling him short. What do you mean, Fred? Well, give me 10 seconds to explain why. He is part of a political dynasty. His father, Mario Como, is a former governor of the state of New York, which has a huge number of electoral college votes. And uh, he's married. Uh, uh, he's married. Andrew is married to one of the Kennedy girls. And uh, he had been a former attorney general of the state of New York. And now he's been a multiple term governor of New York. And he's at the opposite end of the political spectrum from me. But uh, that's what those people are looking for. Well, you're right about the people in New York. Uh, I mean, it, there's no doubt. Um, I just, you know, who was the first person, the first person in the news to say they were going to push back and possibly sue? I don't know how they were going to do that. Um, on the basis of sanctuary cities because they wanted to stay a sanctuary city. Uh, well, that's that's that end of the political spectrum, and those people are off in la la land, but they vote. Well, they do vote. They do vote. I I just I don't see him beating Trump. Um, I just I just don't see it. Um, you know, maybe I maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there are more shadow votes out there that I'm aware of. I just don't uh, I don't see it at this point. Maybe it's because I just dislike Cuomo so much. No, oh, same here, same here. But uh, like I say, he's got uh, the credentials, he's got the family, he's got the financial backing. Uh, he could be a serious candidate. All right. I appreciate it very, very much, Fred. Okay, that's uh, Fred's take on uh, the Democratic possibility of New York Governor Andrew Cuomo. Number nine uh, of possible Democrats to run against Trump in 2020, Ohio Senator Sherrod Brown. Um, on this list, Brown really provides the most complete blend of progressive politics, populism, uh, you got that whole white working class appeal, uh, coming from a swing state, obviously. Um, 
can't dis- discount this, uh, this possibility. Uh, no marquee value, though. And marquee value counts a lot, especially depending on how much money you put into, uh, into a race. Um, and I love this. You know, in my heart of hearts, I, I really wish this guy would, would follow through. You know, despite the fact that he turns 80 in a couple months, I think he may be 80 already, uh, and now California has moved its primary much earlier uh, to this month, uh, that's a huge ton of delegates for a California-based candidate. Governor Moonbeam Brown. You remember him and Linda Ronstadt? See, I, I maintain the only reason this guy got to be governor is because people voted for him that were much too young to remember how bad he screwed it up last time. All right. That would be fun, though, just to watch him talk. Uh, it, it, it's almost, when I see him talking, it's almost like watching an old Cheech and Chong movie. You know what I mean? Probably for the same reason. I, I don't know. Um how about Connecticut Senator Chris Murphy? Um, he provided one of those uh, non-denial denials, uh, asked by CBS if he might run. He said, I am not running for president. I am running for re-election to the Senate. This is what politicians say when they need to make sure they get re-elected first. <laughs> and then they decide to run. It's also completely in present tense, so it's, you know, it's a possibility. I doubt it. Uh, Number six, New Jersey Senator Cory Booker. If I can't have Jerry Moonbeam Brown, uh, let's have this guy. It'd be like the male version of Maxine Waters 24-7, screaming and yelling. and uh, uh, Well, Cory Booker's um, reputation precedes him. Uh, He told uh, Politico that it would be irresponsible for anyone to say they will or won't run for president in 2020, this far out. In in that spirit, you can't rule him out of running. This just feels like a Booker time to me, doesn't it? I mean, with all the craziness going on, you you just, you know, Maxine Waters is still over there on the left coast trying, impeach Trump, <laughs> impeach Trump. Booker is yelling and screaming. Um, California Senator um, Kamala Harris Uh, A lot has been said about this. You know, Harris got out in front when it came to supporting single-payer health care. She got out in front when it uh, came time for calling President Trump resign or be impeached. You know, if the 2020 Democratic primary is a race to the left, she seems intent upon not letting anyone outflank her. And um, so I think you ought to keep keep her in mind. Um, What do we got here? Number, uh, Number four. New York Senate, uh, Senator uh, Kirsten Gillibrand, um, another one that you need to keep in mind. It was Trump's tweet about Gillibrand that sparked Harris to act in the first place. After, uh, you know, herself urged Trump to resign, he tweeted that as a New York senator, she would do anything for campaign contributions, which many took to be sexually suggestive. Of course, Trump said it, so it's got to have a sexual overtone, right? Uh, It's difficult to imagine a bigger gift when it comes to raising uh, her profile in advance of a 2020 run for the Democratic nomination. Uh, She also recently said she thought Bill Clinton should have resigned in the face of his own sexual misconduct. You know, she was trying to, that hashtag me too, she was really trying to own that for a while. Um, First senator to call for fellow Democrat Al Franken to step down. And that will come back up in the campaign if she decides to run. Number three, Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren. You talk about the original, dyed in the wool, cast in stone, screaming Mimi, this is it. Uh, this uh, This is Nancy Pelosi, 30 years younger. That's who, I, I can't even listen to her. I mean, it's, she will say anything at any time. Um, if Warren runs, I think she tops the list. I truly do, based on what the left is doing now. You know, I got a real hard time trying to see her running if Bernie Sanders runs. Yes, he's number one. If he runs, I think she takes a step back for the party. And I think Sanders is very likely to run. Warren has already shown comparatively little inclination to run 
hasn't been front and center except screaming in the hallways. Uh, former Vice President Joe Biden, if he's sober, he may run. Uh, he's in the second spot again. Uh, I think there's too much connection to Obama. Uh, the recent uh, you know, sexual harassment allegations against politicians, the reevaluation of past allegations has you know, put Biden's handling of the Clarence Thomas confirmation back in the spotlight. And trust me, if this guy runs, that Clarence Thomas fiasco will be on every television screen every three or four minutes. And then finally, Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders. Um, and I'll comment on that next. Bernie Sanders, would you like to see the doddering old socialist again? I think you will. All right, uh, 345 the time. Giving you a, a list, and obviously this is uh, maybes, uh, that uh, may run against Trump in 2020. Uh, with uh, the 2020 uh, campaign kicking off in about 12 months, you know, you got to start looking at, uh, you know, who's, uh, who's sticking their foot in the door. Well, Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders tops the list. Uh, you know, if, if you get a chance, it's a must-read story from Politico's uh, Gabriel DiMonetti. Uh, showed how Sanders seems to be addressing the shortcomings that hampered his candidacy in 2016. Now think about it. This guy was basically beating Hillary Clinton to the point where Hillary and the Democratic Party had to stack the deck in their favor against somebody that was in their their own party. They were they were shortchanging the guy. There's no doubt. Um, that alone, if you were you know playing what if I were Bernie Sanders, um, that alone to me would say okay, it's my turn now. I got shortchanged last time. Hillary Clinton and the entire Democratic Party were working against me. Um, you know, most notably, his lack of familiarity with foreign policy, uh, inroads with powerful pro-democratic groups like the American Federation of Teachers, he has done nothing to diminish speculation that he's going to run again. You know, that could be just, you know, bad karma off his last run. I don't think it is. I think he will run again. The biggest question is, and will be, his age. He's 76. As uh, it is with Jerry Brown, who's now 80, and Biden, 76 years old. So I don't think, I mean, young people absolutely love this guy because he stood for just about everything they thought they stood for. Now, after they go out and get a job and get a couple of uh, check stubs and see the deductions and see what's going on, that that will change. But in the meantime, there's still, uh, there's still, just absolutely gathering around Bernie Sanders. I don't think he's willing to walk away from that. So, um, you know, if it was a head-to-head Bernie Sanders, Donald Trump, you know, which way do you think it'll go? Uh, That's so far out of all the people I've talked about that have shown an interest in running in 2020, I think Bernie Sanders would be the guy uh, that would run, not necessarily to win, but would run. I, uh, I don't. I don't see him walking away. Hey, can I take my statement back? What statement? About not voting for Dwayne Rock Johnson. Oh, you'd rather after, have the Rock after you of- read all that list. I think I want to go back to number fifteen. Oh, I see. So that's what. See, that's what I'm talking about. I just went through the top fifteen Democrat presidential candidates for 2020 as it stands now. Of course, that could change in 12 months. I just. I can't. I mean, if you want to be Venezuela. Uh, if you want to be socialist, uh, which kids seem to, the millennials especially, they love all that. Of course, they don't know anything about it or what it is. They just know, hey, it's free college. Uh, partner, nothing in this country is free. Somebody's going to foot the bill somewhere along the line. Um, I, I think Bernie Sanders will be the guy for the Democrats to beat again. And they may. They may try. But after... Uh, losing the Democratic Party chair and losing Hillary Clinton, and I think he's ready. I think that's all he, he's been doing is watching this. Wouldn't you love to see Bernie Sanders every day on the campaign trail? Can't wait. Can't wait to see that.
It's almost as bad as Elizabeth Warren, isn't it? Yeah. Well, uh, I don't know how you feel about those folks. Uh, after getting that list, before I get into the Republicans, I'm going to take your calls. You've heard the people that uh, have shown an interest, that have stated uh, that they may run. Um, anybody on, and of course you know Bernie Sanders from last time around, uh, you know Mario Cuomo because he's pretty high profile. It's New York City. Uh, how do you feel any of these people would fare head head to head with Donald Trump? 1-800-288-WBAP, 1-800-288-9227. I believe out of all those people, out of those top 15 Democrat possible Democrat presidential candidates, uh, the one I would fear the most if I were running Trump's campaign for re-election would be Bernie Sanders. And not for a logical reason, but because kids absolutely, I mean, they were, you know what happened last time. The Democrat, uh, Democrat Party had to work behind the scenes uh, to try and put this guy down, to try and put Hillary above him. He was beating her. He was absolutely beating Hillary Clinton, the foregone conclusion to the to the entire race. It, uh, I, I'm telling you, if he runs, it uh, it might be a horse race. Do you think the public is tired of professional politicians? I don't know, Randy. I, I look at it this way. Uh, you know, it, it's a funny thing. For, for 20 years, the mantra has been, I want my country back, I want my country back, I want my country back. Um, they installed a billion-dollar playboy real estate developer just to show the status quo, uh, they still control the process, which was a good thing. Uh, Reagan was a citizen politician, but we're not in Reagan's time anymore. It's not the same political landscape. Um, as long as Trump continues for the next year as he has, yeah, there may be something there. Or they're going to go diametrically opposed to that. Well, I'm just too uncomfortable. I feel too sketchy. I'm going to go back to what I know. No, let well, Hillary hear you say that. Going back to what you know could be the biggest mistake you ever made. I mean, what, so, what's been going on the last 20 years? Yeah. Well, it's either going to be one or the other. There is, in this, I can't see any gray area here. Um, Amy. Uh, Amy, I'm not exactly sure where Amy's calling from. Uh, Amy, thank you for waiting. How you doing, Amy? I'm doing good. I'm calling from telephone. Texas. Oh, okay. Um, well, I think, like you said, I think Bernie Sanders probably, um, I think he would be a big contender for Trump, especially he would have been last time. But um, I don't want to see a woman as president. I know that sounds crazy, but as a woman, um I don't like to see women in politics too much. Really? And I say that. No, wait, wait, wait a second before I'm before they <laughs> you know storm the station with pitchforks <laughs> and torches. Why, as a woman, why is it you don't like to see women in politics? Um, well, my views are probably controversial. Um, I think women and men are very different. Um, they I are. Believe they think different. They act different, and that's a good thing. I think we were designed to be different, and I think women are very emotional. And I think as you've seen women enter politics more and more and more, I think you've seen a lot of uh, feeling-based policy increase. We've got it welfare, um, this and this and that. And I think women, I hate to say it, I, I just, um, I, I, I just, I don't want a woman president. I think they're too emotional. I think we deal uh, diplomacy with a lot of countries who do not see women in power roles, such as the Middle East. Um, the Middle East, Russia, and Asiatic countries value strength and male strength. They're very patriarchal societies. Um, and so I like to see a man in that seat, not a woman. Well, I, I, I agree with you. Men and women are different. And especially yeah. liberal women. <laughs> well, yeah, that's true. But, I mean, gender-wise, men and women are different. Um, they and, are. You know, we keep trying to make them the same, but they're not designed the same. Um, no. I mean, no. one deals out of emotion tempered with logic. The other, most of the time, deals with logic tempered out of emotion. And you yes. look at, instead of trying to make everybody the same, we ought to be celebrating the differences, not trying to ignore them. Well, and, and may I say this, th there's another reason for this as well. Um, I, I have I have three children, a daughter and two sons. And as a mother of sons, I don't like the way the country's going. It's very anti-man. 
Uh, we've gone, I'm not a feminist, I, at least not a second or third wave. Um, and also, I'd like to say, you know, my husband works for, um, in the aero defense uh, industry. And I also would go so far as I don't really think men and women need to work together that much. We've been trying this experiment for about, mm, what, 70, 80 years, and I don't think it's healthy. Um, I've seen my husband and his coworkers, uh, just, the, just the environment of women. Women can say one thing. They can say, this person made me feel uncomfortable. And you would see HR explode, and they'll do everything they can to make sure that woman is, you know, you know, we don't want to make her feel uncomfortable. But the word uncomfortable is very ambiguous. And the men, a lot in his, his office, and he does work in the engineering field, so there's mainly men, and also across the company, they know, they know. Don't cross a woman because you'll never win. Yeah. Uh, Amy, I, I got I'm on a heartbreaker. I got to. A very interesting phone call, Amy. Very interesting indeed. Um, and Amy says Sanders is the best and women shouldn't be president. I think she's right. Well, I think she's right as far as Bernie Sanders. Um, I, I don't see any female in the current crop of Democrats um, that I would be comfortable with, not because of their gender, but because of who they are and what they've been. All right, let me step aside. Back with your calls, 1-800-288-WBAP, 1-800-288-9227. Your call straight ahead in the court of public opinion. This is the News and Talk of Texas. Now, it's the Rick Roberts Show on 820 AM, 99.5 FM, HD2, News Talk 820, WBAP. Well, I know there's got to be a few hundred million more like me just trying to keep it free. Yeah. Rick Roberts starts. Rick Roberts starts right now. And five minutes after the hour, 4.05 the time, I'm Rick Roberts. This is the Court of Public Opinion. Your voice, your opinion, your attitude on the issues of the day. I just gave you the top 15 possible Democratic candidates um, that would be running against Trump in 2020. I've got the Republicans, not nearly as long a list, but I don't want to leave Sanders just yet. You know, Bernie Sanders, he said on Friday, this past Friday, that Democrats could flip Texas in the upcoming elections. If voters were willing to put in the work, he believed the 38 electoral votes could go to Democrats. Um, He said, and I'm quoting, "If if you in Texas are prepared to work hard, stand up, fight back, go out to your neighbors, talk to those people who voted for President Trump last time, make sure that every friend you have, every family member that you have, comes out and votes, yeah, I believe that Texas can go blue. He was at the annual uh, South by Southwest Festival in Austin. You know, the 2016 Democratic presidential candidate said that voters would have to get involved in the political process in a way that they have never done in modern history of the country. The only thing he left out, if you love Venezuela... If you want Hugo Chavez in the White House, well, no, he didn't say that. Uh, You know, Texas held the first congressional primary of the 2018 midterm elections uh, this past Tuesday, prompting a surge in Democratic turnout. And I told you at the time, don't bank this. Don't bank any of it. We're a long way from being there. That was the other night when I hung out with uh, Governor Greg Abbott on the Facebook Live thing. Um, You know, a huge Democratic turnout, but still Republican turnout remained higher at the end of the day, which was a good thing because from the previous midterms, Democrats voted with an increase of 98%. That's how pathetic it was last time around. But there's, you know, I was asked by, uh, who was it? I think it was uh, Governor Abbott's campaign uh, spokesman. Why, what did I attribute that huge 98% increase in turnout uh, for the midterms from from Democrats? Now, is it because they just love Democrats that much? No, it's because they hate Trump that much. That's why. 
Um, you know, with the good comes the bad. Democrats have been energized by their opposition to Trump, and they're trying to make gains in Republican-held districts across the country, not just here in Texas, in the midterm elections, um, in an effort to win control of the House. Sanders, Bernie Sanders, has crisscrossed the country this year in an effort to rally support for Democrats in a very competitive race. Um, I'm telling you, the guy's coming. The guy's coming. And if you love socialism, and if you're a millennial and you answered yes to that question, please call me and give me your definition of socialism. All right? If not, well, I'll explain it and we'll work it out together. But if you don't know what it is, man, don't vote for it. Uh, all right, let's uh, let's go to uh, Mary in Sulphur Springs. Mary, thanks for waiting. How you doing? Oh, I'm good today. Thank you for taking my call. You bet. I listen. I listen every opportunity I get, and um, and I was so glad that I was uh, uh, actually listening a few moments ago. To, I think it was your last caller that wasn't going to vote um, for a woman for president. I think is the gist of her call. That you uh, got pretty much. It, it, she said Bernie looks like the contender for the Democrats. Uh, she's a conservative, but she doesn't want a woman in the White House. Right, and. Um, and I, I am I'm also a conservative, and um, I couldn't agree with her more about um, I hate to say this, but about women in politics and and other and other positions. Um, of course, I'm a woman, and I don't feel like that I that I have ever been discriminated against in any shape, form, or fashion in any job position that I've ever had, or just in general, as being a woman. But she is. She is so right that men and women are different, and we were made that different, and that's a positive thing. And I have just, it, I've just had my eyes open really wide in this last year as to how much that it has gone um, uh, with women's rights and, and the way that, that um, and I'll just say most women seem to feel, they've gone too far the, the, the other direction in our court systems and, like she said, in the workplace, if, if you know, if anything, it's just people are just afraid. And I, I think that's so wrong, and I wish that, I wish that it would go back more, more to, the, to the middle there. But in this last election, I hate to say this. Of course, you know, I, I really don't hate to say it because I, I or obviously, or I wouldn't. But I didn't um, when I had when I was voting, and I tried to uh, know the know the um, you know what the candidate was for and everything. But um, obviously, I, I voted all Republican. But I did not vote for any women. Um, on that ballot, and well, uh, I, I've and got I got a question, Mary. I, I have a question for you. I'm, I got a break very quickly. David, ask if Mary can hang on for just a second. You said you've had your eyes opened recently, and therefore wouldn't vote for a woman. I, I'm curious because I'm wired that way. Why is that? How were how were your eyes open? What occurred in your life? that uh, sent you perhaps in a different direction. Mary, if you can hang on, I'd love to get an answer to that. Um, i got to step aside very quickly, check the afternoon drive and a few other things. I'm Rick Roberts. Your call straight ahead. All right, uh, 4.16 the time. Mary uh, called saying that she agreed with a previous female caller saying that uh, she wouldn't vote for a female president. She said her eyes had been opened and my question to Mary, and she agreed to hang on. Thank you very much, Mary. What opened your eyes? Well, nothing that happened in my life personally. I, I didn't mean that. But, um, well, the one thing is when, when all of these women started coming out that they had been um, – uh, sexually harassed or whatever term they use for that years and years and years ago. Well, first of all, if I thought that that was important to them, they would have come forward at that time. And then uh, seeing the way that Hillary behaved and, um, you know, um, the, the Nancy Pelosi, the, seeing the way that she acts, I think that women uh, play that, that gender card, if you will, far more than I realized they would, and they seem to go 
by emotions more than uh, more than laws and facts. And it is just uh, it is just disgusted me to see that kind of behavior. And I, I so I just uh, I think long and hard before I would uh, that before I would vote for a woman and put her in any kind of um, a power. And and I would have to make sure that I thought you know that that she wouldn't uh, you know legislate like that or, or make decisions. Like so that. would it be fair to say, and if not, please tell me, uh, the way you feel, this, uh, this newfound political mindset, if you will, um, is it a backlash of sorts against the hashtag Me Too sexual harassment movement, and that's what it was, uh, mm-hmm. that, uh, that uh, washed over the country? Would it be fair to say it's, it's somewhat of a backlash? It is somewhat of a backlash um, from that, and not that's not one hundred percent what I what I base you know uh, my decisions on now. But that but I would say that that probably played you know thirty five percent. The other thirty five percent is you know I wouldn't have voted for Hillary anyway. But but just to just the way. You, that she, the, the unfair, you know, part of it. I, I mean, you know, I, I think it, it's bigger than that. The world is not about fair and unfair. The, the world is about, uh, you know, the Constitution, our rights, and uh, and the laws. And I think they should be upheld. And um, and I, I'm just not sure that from what I from what I take from from the female candidates and female actions of, of people now I I've, I've lost a little confidence in that I think they play that female card too often and I don't I I, I don't agree with that at all. Uh, Mary, very uh, very interesting call, very informative too. I appreciate it very very much. And I appreciate you hanging on through the break there. Thank you very much, Mary. Good call. Uh, Maria, Maria in Euless. Maria, thank you for waiting. How you doing, Maria? I'm doing fine. Thank you for taking my call. Rick. You bet. Um, I think that Sanders is going to have some trouble because he kind of showed him his substance when he endorsed Hillary. And I think a lot of them defected over and voted for Trump. And they were kind of angry with that. And I think he's going to have a hard time getting those people back because of the fact that he showed them what he was made of under pressure. And then I think the land scandal with his wife is going to come up because it was one of Trump's people that pointed that out to the FBI. And that's still under probe and they can use that against him possibly if he runs. And I know they were afraid of that, that they weren't so afraid of the 2016, but they are afraid of the 2020 that it could be thrown out there. And To the people that don't believe in women, I think I'm a big advocate for if Donald Trump doesn't run in 2020, I think Janine Pirro, Judge Janine Pirro, would be so (laughs) wonderful because she holds herself so well, and she's the type of person that wouldn't expect any dumbing down, and she's the type that respects men. She's not a big feminist. She's just the type that has earned what she's done in her life. And I think she would, I mean, she would, if you watched her show and her opening statements, she would take on Obama, she would take on Michelle Obama, and she just lays it out there like Donald Trump, but in an eloquent way. But she is a very strong woman, who, and she who, would make a wonderful president. Uh, Maria, who did you vote for this last time around, if you Trump. don't mind saying Trump? Um, mm-hmm. now, if it came up, uh, I'm not dismissing Judge uh, Jeanine Pirro, but if it came up between uh, Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump, um, how much of a horse race do you think that would be? I don't, I think Donald Trump is a person that, um, has been used to being able to take anybody on. And I think he's going to be okay. And I think with uh, the accomplishments, cause he still has several years to go. So, Unless he really screws up, I think he should be okay. But uh, I, I, think, I think I think you're right. You know the latest move by the Democrats, um, and it's just now coming out, is to forget Donald Trump, but go after his evangelical voters by saying, mm-hmm. uh, "How can you be an evangelical um, Christian Protestant? Uh, how can you do that and vote for a man uh, that doesn't have the morals of an evangelical?" doesn't have a personal history of an evangelical. They're trying to shame evangelicals into not 
backing Trump any longer because they say Trump is the antithesis of what they believe. Yeah, but if they don't, they don't understand their religion, you'll understand that even Jesus consorted with uh, the sinners. He much rather be with the sinners than he was with the um, ones that thought that they were, you know, like the Pharisees. Well, I, you know, I would say to those Democratic strategists, may, you might want to open the Bible. Yeah. I'm not saying I read it enough as I should, but when Peter asked Jesus, hey, I got this situation with someone, how many times do I have to forgive them? Is seven enough? And what was Jesus' response? 70 times seven and further and further how many times a day does your father heavenly father uh forgive you try to do the same thing yeah but even at that you you know i usually say when people are saying stuff about people but who am i i mean because unless you are without sin it's like how can you sit there and you know because then you're going to be judged to a higher standard exactly you know sitting there judging but i do believe that you know as long as he keeps on the same path and stuff and the fact that the Christians know that, you know, we've all sinned, but he seems to be a man that's not afraid to recognize God, and that speaks a lot when he's up on the highest platform and held to higher accountability, and he speaks about God and uh, does things in the name of God, and it's just a fact that that's going to stand for a lot. Well, no, you're, you're absolute, absolutely 100% spot on to those Democratic strategists that are trying to drive a wedge between evangelical voters, and there are a ton of them. Um, and and Trump, I, w- I would say this: you don't you don't know what you're messing with. Um, you know, as long as he keeps God first, as long as uh, you know uh, he repents of whatever uh, he's done in the past, none of us are to sit in judgment of that. That's a much higher calling than politics. So you know. Uh, Democrats had had the stage for a long, long time. You know, you just didn't uh, you didn't speak out about what is important to people, and I think that and that alone will tell the story. All right, uh, I gave you uh, the top fifteen Democratic presidential candidates for twenty twenty, emerging from that list, at least by my estimation, and I could be wrong, but um, I believe Bernie Sanders. I mean, look at what the guy's doing. He hadn't slowed down since he lost. Uh, uh, lost the campaign. I mean, he's been back and forth coast to coast almost continually for a year. Uh, latest uh, was in Austin uh, for the uh, South by Southwest. And now he's making noise about they can flip. They'll be able to flip if enough, if enough Democrats get involved. He believes you can flip the state of Texas. Well, you know, I don't know. That's 38 electoral votes. That'd be a, a pretty big feather in the Democrats' cap. I don't, I don't see it happening. I think there are still enough people in Texas with common sense. You know, I could be wrong. Four twenty-five. I don't think I am. Four twenty-five. The time. Your call straight ahead. We'll check uh, Eric Bushman in the WBAP newsroom. Check your afternoon drive, and right back with your calls. Man, I like that. Crank that a little bit. All right, uh, four thirty-three. The time, man. You know, I, I read and do other prep all the time. <laughs> I feel so sorry for most of you. How you get your news? You know, I'm immersed in it. Um, you know, liberal, conservative, somewhere in the middle, apolitical, every single day. So I, you know, I have to deal with it. You know, CNN uh, is well. It's a liberal network. You can't deny that. They used to have a uh, facts first ad campaign, but it hasn't updated its Trump's job tracker in months because of an explosion in jobs. It was last updated in January. Uh, they made a big deal out of the fact, hey, we're going to keep track of what he said he was going to do. He hasn't done it. CNN, uh, if you look, Trump promised to add 208,000 jobs per month. And the features, the message, he's off track. Well, actually, they're off track. They haven't updated it since January. Uh, he added 200,000 jobs in January. That's what he was off track. He was off track by 8,000 jobs. Uh, but then he made up for it the next uh, month with 313,000 jobs. Um, that was the most growth in a single month since 2016. So it left CNN's jobs tracker badly outdated, not to mention 
misleading. Not not that they would do that intentionally. Of course not. Um, it's just, but man, what's the, per, why do you, I guess maybe national weather, do they even do that? That They can't lie about that. All right. I gave you the top 15 Democratic uh, presidential candidates for, um, for 2020. Now, out of that, there were 15. I'd say Cuomo might be in there. I don't like his chances. I mean, I know he's going to get, um, now, he's from New York, obviously. He's, he's going to get the 29 electoral votes, no doubt. And he's obviously going to get, you know, California's got 55. That goes to the Democrats, too. Um, Bernie Sanders seems to think if everybody go out and work really hard, uh, they, can flip, uh, they can flip Texas blue and take those 38 electoral votes. Um, well, let me, give you, uh, let me give you the list. Um, as it stands right now, Trump challengers, 10 Republicans who could run, might run in 2020. Um, Carly Fiorina. And I'll be honest with you, I liked her. I think she's a bit out of her element. But then, you know, you could say the same thing about Trump. Um, you know, Republican president candidate uh, Carly Fiorina, she, uh, you know, addressed supporters all over the country. Uh, she had all kinds of town hall style meetings. Um, you know, but that, you know, going to fly over state Montana and going to Ethel's cafe when it opens up at five o'clock in the morning for a cup of coffee and put your, you know, and it's so fun. Please, if you're a politician, don't do this. Don't put on a pair of jeans and a pair of knockoff boots. You got it. You know, I'm not knocking Walmart, but just don't do that. They're not real boots and your jeans are too short and it looks silly. All right. If I dressed like that and went to school, they'd have beat me up and sent me home. Um, they always do that. Well, we're here at Ethel. Ethel, who are you voting for? I'm voting for you. Well, I'll take another key. I'll warm you up there. Yeah, let me have some of that chocolate pie, too. It just doesn't work. You know, you can still relate to people without trying to do an impression of them. All right? Something the Democrats don't know. Um. Carly Fiorina, I, I'm not, I'm not, I don't know. Uh, Ohio governor, now I cannot stand this guy. Couldn't stand him when he was running last time. Who do you think I'm talking about? Kasich, John Kasich. Yep, absolutely. Ohio Governor uh, Kasich. Um, it's not his facial or verbal tics, which he has. We all do. Uh, it's not that his are a bit more pronounced. It's not that. I, I, I just nothing he says makes sense to me more often than not when I add two and two I want to come up with four and with him it's just very difficult um he just uh I'm sorry it's uh I don't like anything about the guy I, I just don't um who else no I'll, Kasich's uh, constituency has remained supportive believe it or not they stuck to this guy like gorilla glue uh, for the last year they, they love him they liked him when he dropped last time uh so you know he appears to have shifted his position on another pre- presidential run he was asked on cnn state of the union back in march whether he would uh, look to the primary and he repeatedly repeatedly answered no well a month later he shifted saying well it was very unlikely then in May, he told Bill Maher, uh, Bill Maher is a friend of mine. We don't agree on anything, but I've known him a long time. He and I used to do those college, he would book these college speaking things, and I'd go up. I was Bill's warm-up band, all right? And if you could, well, I won't say that. That would be giving away stories, and I don't want to do that. Uh, he told Bill Maher, he doesn't know what his plans are. Bill has a way of pulling things out of people, which is, uh, I appreciate. I don't know what I'm going to do. Uh, about the 2020 look for him he's going to be there uh senator ben sass of nebraska um you know he was the guy that questioned senator jeff sessions during his confirmation hearing uh, to be the next u.s attorney general in the uh, russell senate office building um sessions was one of the first members of congress to endorse and support president-elect donald trump and didn't seem to set well with Sass. Um, you know, he's taken his fight to Trump's cyber doorstep. 
I, I think is a good way of putting it. He's subtweeted continuously Trump uh, after the president attacked MSNBC's Morning Joe co-host Mika Brzezinski. Why? Why? I mean, it's not like she's Wolf Blitzer. I mean, uh, claiming to have seen her bleeding after undergoing cosmetic surgery. That's the kind of crap that, that Trump doesn't need. He doesn't need it. Um, but Sass got involved with that. Uh, as a matter of fact, I got a copy of the tweet. Please just stop. This isn't normal, and it's beneath the dignity of your office. And you can't argue with that, all right? Nobody said Trump was perfect. Um, how about uh, Susan Martinez? Is it Susan or Susanna? I always forget. Martinez? I think it's Susanna. Uh, she refused to endorse President Trump during the 2016 campaign. She could be a potential Republican challenger in the 2020, and she's starting to get more name recognition, uh, especially with the Dreamers and the DACA and all that stuff. Uh, you're hearing her name more and more and more. Um, you know, we'll see. We'll see what happens with her. I don't. I honestly don't know that much about her. Um, what do you think, Senator Ted Cruz? Man, I would hate to go through um, another campaign with Ted Cruz versus Donald Trump, wouldn't you? I just uh I think that would be a nightmare for Ted Cruz. I, I do. I, I think do. he needs to step back and wait four years, then go after Trump. You know, he may want another crack at sixteen hundred Pennsylvania. No one in the in the political world doubts the intensity of uh the ambition this guy has. Uh I don't think for what it's worth you know, I get the chance to speak with somebody for about three minutes per call. What, 20 times in a three-hour period, 30 times? Um, so you have to learn to read language. You try to listen to that which is not being said. I don't think Cruz's personality bests Trump's. I think it's a personality difference. And once you compare and contrast uh, Cruz comes up on the short end of the stick. And it's not because of his political beliefs, and it's not because of his, uh, his sincerity. He's totally sincere. Uh, and it's, it's none of that. It's, it's not the message. It's the messenger, if, if you know what I mean. If you put the two guys together, I think Trump comes out on top each time. And, uh, you know, I think you can probably campaign around that, but I've not seen it, not from the Cruz camp. Um, so uh, Mitt Romney, Mitt Romney is the other name that everybody is looking for. Um, you think, I don't know. I, I've got a lot of history with Mitt Romney. I, again, I did these town hall meetings on the West coast. I like him. He's a nice guy. Great businessman. I don't think, uh, Mitt Romney has a chance against Trump. Uh, Mark Cuban. Yeah, that was yesterday's newspaper. Uh, vice president, Mike Pence. I, I, you know, they're, they're throwing his name saying he may run. Why would he? Uh, I, I, I don't think so. Um, I just don't think it would happen. The clo the closest competition, um, was Pence 10 to one. So I, I just don't think that will happen. So here's the bottom line. I've given you the top 15 Democrats. I've given you the top 10 Republicans, uh, who goes down as the strongest contender Nose to nose, mano a mano, against Trump in 2020. Your call's next. 1 800 288 WBAP, 1 800 288 9227. We'll find out what you think next. All right, uh, 48 minutes after the hour. Learn to read. 448 the time. I'm Rick Roberts. Glad you're along. Uh, let me get to your calls. Let's go to Todd in Plano. Todd, how you doing? Rick, how are you? I'm well, thank you. Rick, everyone's missing the nightmare. I can bear. I can. Todd, I can barely hear you. The nightmare for Trump is Michelle Obama. Well, you think Michelle Obama's going to run? I think that she and her husband are horrified at having their legacy taken apart. And I think they want those parties in the White House with Beyonce and Stevie Wonder and, and Al Sharpton. And I think they want that life back and they want to turn back and, and go back and, and undo what Trump does. 
And yeah. that's the way that they're going to get that. I don't think Michelle, this is my own opinion, Todd. I don't think Michelle Obama would have a prayer against Trump. I just think that above any Democrat, she would have more of a chance with all those women marchers and all the angry girls. I really do believe she would be a threat. All right. There you go. Hadn't even thought of that. Um, well, I mean, I've heard people say it, but I just don't, uh, I don't think Michelle's got any background at all. She was at the White House for eight years, but what did she do except take away pizza and give you carrot sticks in school? I, I mean, that was about it. Todd, I appreciate the call very much. Uh, let's go to uh, Sebastian in Fort Worth. Sebastian, thank you for waiting. How you doing? I'm doing good, Rick. Yourself? Good. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, I think you're right on with the Bernie Sanders thing. Uh, there were a lot of people who... Uh, we're voting for Bernie Sanders in the primary that were really they're really aggravated whenever uh, Hillary Clinton and the DNC kind of ripped him off. So they ended up voting for Trump or not voting at all during the general election. Um, and those people, if Bernie runs again, which I really believe he will, those people will just go right back to Bernie. They'll go away from Trump and go right back to Bernie. So um, I think that'll that'll really help him out a lot there. Um, as far as as far as Republicans, I think the only person that would ever, uh, or and they don't have a chance at all, and it would be Ted Cruz. And as much as I want to see Ted Cruz uh, be the president, because he's one of few people in politics that I feel has a way of thinking that's kind of on par with the founders. Um, he just, I think it's kind of like what you said. He he's it's his personality. Doesn't really come you know, across very well. I, you, I, you know, maybe I missed it because I like Ted Cruz. Uh, maybe I misspoke by saying his personality. I think it's his non-confrontational demeanor. Well, I have a lot of people that tell me they're like, you know, I really just don't like Ted Cruz. I'm like, well, why didn't you like Ted Cruz? Um, I mean, he's, in my personal opinion, he's the greatest political mind in politics right now. Um, that's just my own personal opinion, but people always tell me, they're like, well, I just, there's something about him. I don't like him. I've had one person tell me it's his nose. I don't like his nose. I'm like, well, that's, that's not a reason not to like a politician because of their nose. I mean, right, um, right. it's, uh, I, I, I really, as much as I would love to see him be the president, he, he wouldn't beat Trump. It would just be 2016 all over again. You know, he'd, he'd be think, with him I in the end right. and then yeah, he'd be with him in the end and then he would eventually just lose out. I think you're. I think you're absolutely right. Appreciate the call. Uh, let's go to Chris in Dallas. Chris, thanks for waiting. How you doing, Chris? Pretty good, Rick. Thanks for taking my call. You bet. I pretty much got two comments. Uh, I think you're right. I think Bernie's probably the best bet on the on the Democrat side. Uh, Republic. If the economy keeps going the way it is, uh, there's not a Republican that's got a chance. And uh, I don't think Bernie really has a chance either. When you give these college students a couple of years to get out of school and start making some money. Uh, you know, they'll forget about that socialism. Uh, and my second comment is, as a an evangelical Christian, uh, I don't take any uh, moral advice for baby killers. I, <laughs> I just don't. Well, they're working. They're working hard to try and split evangelical voters from Trump, uh, saying, well, how can you be a evangelical if you vote for a guy like this? I mean, you knew they had to come up with some strategy. That's it. Uh, Joan in uh, Philadelphia. Joan, thank you for waiting. How you doing? Good. I have been really enjoying your show from Philadelphia. Thank you. And um, I was listening to some women calling in, and um, the only thing that I would want to say to those women who don't seem to want would be hesitant to vote for other women would be six words: Indira Gandhi, Golda Meir, and Margaret Thatcher. Well, and, and you know what? Again, I'm... I would agree with you, Joan, except those are distinctly different cultures. Well, uh, you know, do you know what I mean? I mean, no, uh, but, there's, but there's three distinctly different cult cultures, and we're a fourth culture, and I'm sure that we would have somebody, if somebody decided to run, who is, you know, a, a woman who's a good candidate, that would be a good candidate, <laughs> you know. Yeah, hey, Joan, I'm I'm right there. With, I'm right there with you. I'm right there with you. I don't care if it's a man, woman, short, tall, fat, thin, black, white. Uh, we just need good leadership. We need somebody to do what they say they're going to do. So far, Trump has done that, fighting against un, unbelievable odds, fighting the Democrats, the media, members of his own party. Um, I just wonder 
uh, in a, about a year when the, the 2020 campaign kicks off. Who's going to be sitting across the table? Joan, great call. Thank you for the call from Philadelphia. Please have a great evening. 4.54 the time. God's blessings on each and every one of you, whether you agree with me or not. That's always my priority. I'll see you tomorrow at 2, your afternoon drive on News Talk 820 WBAP.